Good morning, church. Welcome to Tiger Covenant Church. If you're here in the room or watching online, we're glad you're here. And it's Christmas time, so we got to sing our Christmas carols. Amen. Turn to somebody and say we're celebrating Christ's birth. Let's start our service this morning with a word of prayer. And after the word of prayer, we'll have our Advent reading. Father, we thank you so much for the privilege of being together as your kids to honor you, to love on you, and to see you love on us is a great privilege. Thank you so much, Lord. Bless our time together. Fill us with who you are, because we shall need you. We love you, and we thank you for this privilege. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said amen. amen. Turn and greet someone in the name of the Lord. Uh, this is the second Sunday of Advent. Today we begin by relighting the prophecy candle. We also light the second candle on the Advent wreath, the Bethlehem candle. It is a symbol of the preparations being made to receive and to cradle the Christ child. Luke 2, 1 through 4. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, where he belonged to the house and line of David. Shall we pray? Lord God, thank you that you prepared a place for our Savior to be born. Help us to prepare our hearts to receive him again this Advent season. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's all stand together. And let's bless the Lord. I want to sing a new song. Shout it out louder than before. Let the whole earth sing. The whole earth sing. It's a song of praise. A song for all. A song of praise, a song for all of the redeemed. Let the whole earth sing, the whole earth sing. Never the same, never the same. He's taken my chains, his freedom in Jesus, power to save. 
is a name like no other, like no other name. It's freedom in Jesus to shout out his name. I want to sing a new song. Shout it out louder than before. Let the whole earth sing. The whole earth sing. The whole earth sing. It's a song. It's a song of praise. We bless you, Lord. A song for all of the redeemed. Let the whole earth sing. The whole earth sing. The whole earth sing. Sing hallelujah. Hallelujah. much for being here. We need you, Lord. Make 
who you are. You are here touching every heart. You, you are, are here. Touching every heart. Touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here healing. You are here. stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working you know what how many of you need god to work in your lives this day i know i do Many years ago, my sister Renee, she would talk about, she would talk about how God is working behind the scenes in ways you cannot see or understand yet. Working for your good. So some of you can't see what's going on and it feels like Man, where is God? But I want to tell you, he's always working behind the scenes in your behalf. And all we need to do is just keep holding on, keep trusting him, keep believing, keep believing that he's, he's orchestrating something you don't understand yet. He's working on something that you can't see just yet. But he is working in our behalf, behind the scenes, taking care of the business of his kids. You know, he's a loving God. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when 
you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working.
thing you can do is worship him. I worship you. I worship you. I bow before your throne and worship you. opening them up. This is a holy moment in the service. It's so wonderful that we are here together at this time on this second Sunday of Advent, and we're getting ready to take communion. And as we get ready to take communion, uh, I'm going to ask Haley and uh, Chuck to pray after I read the scripture. And this is a time when we can remember the coming of Jesus. And what is the purpose of the coming of Jesus? 
The scripture says he came so that we would have life, that he died on the cross so that we would have new life. He came so that we would be forgiven of our sins. So let's look at the scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 12. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many of you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. So it's a very sobering passage. What this essentially means is that only those who have asked Jesus, number one, number one, only those who have asked Jesus Christ to forgive them of their sins, who have embraced him as their Lord and Savior, only those should partake in this meal. And then secondly, those of us who have said yes to Jesus, that we're born again, we should only partake this morning if our hearts and minds are clear with God and are clear with our neighbors. That means if you have any ought, you have any disagreement between you and your neighbor, now's a good time to ask that neighbor to forgive you. Now's a good time for you to ask God to forgive you before you partake of this cup. And if you haven't had a chance to do that, don't take communion. Let me repeat that, do not take communion. This is a very holy moment when Jesus and God looks at the death of his son and the shedding of his blood as a serious thing. So we should rejoice and we should all be thankful. Everyone say, thank you, Lord. Because the scripture says, as we just read, it says, on the night he was betrayed. Isn't that interesting when communion took place? It took place right at the moment when he was betrayed. There's another scripture in Romans says that, but God commendeth his love toward you and me, toward us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When we were at our worst, Christ died. When we were at our worst, Jesus offered up the meal of the Last Supper. And so now we are grateful. So let's bow our heads this morning. Let's ask God to forgive us if we need to. Let's ask God to cleanse us if we need to. Let's thank God if we're in good standing with him and with our neighbors as we have a moment of silence, a moment of prayer. And after that moment of silence, I'm going to ask Chuck and Haley to pray. Haley to pray for the bread. Chuck to pray for the blood. Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today and for this time to reflect. I pray over this bread that we're about to break in remembrance of you and your body. And I pray that as we're repenting in our hearts and reflecting and um, just coming to you with our full hearts and full minds, Lord, all focus on you, that in this time of remembrance of what you've done for us and how you died for us and how your body was beaten and broken just like this bread, that it would be, as Pastor said, a sobering moment for us to really um, meditate on, not just right now, but throughout the rest of today as well. And I pray that um, just how impactful that is in our lives, um, you just continue to remind us of that. Awesome, Lord Jesus. How you must have loved us so much, willing to give up your your glory in heaven to come down to this earth to suffer and die for us to shed your blood you bled from head to toe it's unbelievable what they put you through but because of your blood that saved us so Lord Jesus we thank you we thank you and we thank you for your sacrifice of blood it's in your name we pray these things amen so Jesus took bread among them, he held it before them, and then he broke it. And he said, 
This bread is my body. Let's eat together. Then Jesus took the cup among them, and he said, this cup is my blood, the new covenant in my blood. Let's drink together. I think we all can say, thank you, Jesus. It was my cross, Lord, so I could live in the freedom you died for. And now my life is yours, and I will sing of your goodness forever. Your name. 
within me. Bless his holy name. You may be seated. Amen. Children are dismissed for Children's Church. And children, you go and be blessed. Go with Teacher Janet. Give them a hand clap as they go. Bless the children. I'd like to talk to you this morning about the reign of Christ, and we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11, if you have your Bibles, open up to this passage of Scripture, and we're going to look at verse 1, and let's stand for the reading of God's Word. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. I'll read it together. I mean, I'll, we'll, we'll, um, we'll read it together, and then I'll read it first, rather, and then I'll say the Word of the Lord, and together we will say thanks be to God. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, the young will lie down together, the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on my holy mountain, for all the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his resting place will be glorious. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We ask that you bless it to our hearts as we look into this passage of Scripture and to see, Jesus, who you are and what you mean to us and how much you love us and how much you are going to reign on earth. We're excited about your soon return, your soon coming, and we ask, oh God, that you are blessed this time. In Jesus' name we pray. And we all said, you may be seated. We are in the end times. We've been speaking about it the last couple of Sundays, and the end times mean that the age that we're in now, this time period that we're in, is moving toward conclusion. It's moving toward the end of time. It's moving toward the time where, as we know it, things will actually radically change. The Bible says that uh, there's a period in 1 Thessalonians that talks about a rapture. A rapture means the calling up, the taking up of the church. And the Bible says in that passage that Christ himself will come from heaven with a trumpet, with a shout, and those who are alive will be caught up with the Lord in the air. And it says those who are dead will rise up and we will be with the Lord. And so this time period where the church is united with Christ, our bodies are changed. Those people who have died before us are going to be changed. Those of us who are Christians will be changed, will be caught up, will get supernatural bodies. Then there's another period in time the Bible speaks about, and if you want to look at these things more closely, Brother Chuck, hold up your hand. Chuck is our elder, and he's going to be doing a class on Revelation, the first of the year, and we'll be doing that class on Sunday mornings at 8.30, and I'll be joining Chuck and the other, some of the leaders of the church will be there, and we're going to be looking at these end times, and so there's several time periods that's going to happen. One of the periods is the rapture. Another time period is the seven-year tribulation, the great tribulation where There's going to be pain and agony and wars. And then during this time, there's going to be a one world world leader that's going to rise up. Currency is not going to be used anymore. And the sign of the 666 is going to be that which people can buy food. And if you have the sign of the 666 on your wrist or on your forehead, you'll be able to participate. If you don't have the sign of the 666, then that means that you are not buying into the devil's agenda. Don't get that label. Don't get that sign put on your body. But the church, I believe, will be gone at that point. But those who remain, if you miss it, don't get that symbol because the sign of the 666 is the mark of the beast or the mark of the devil. These are all amazing things that are talked about in the book of Revelation, and we're going to be studying it 
And so as we look at this time period and we get ready for it, God is clear in his word. And I've spoken it to you so clearly these last couple of weeks that we have to get ready for those times. And then after that time period of the great tribulation, then there's going to come a great war that's going to occur in the Middle East. And it's going to be the war against good and evil. And Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ himself is going to be leading that charge in that war and is going to deal with all the evil people in the world. And you see in this passage in Isaiah, it says that Jesus, it says the sword is going to come out of his mouth. He's going to be so powerful, and he's going to slay the wicked. You know, I've been watching this one TV series on Netflix, and it's called The Last Kingdom. And it's just a story about the Saxons, the English, and they were fighting against the Danes. And then I studied other wars and throughout history and watched movies on the history, the Asian wars, the great leaders that have engaged in these wars. And I've just, my heart's been so heavy about why in humanity, why in humanity's name, why uh, even in God's name, must we pick up the sword, must, must we pick up the gun, must we pick up the bomb, and why do we have to fight each other? And so we cry out for saying to God, we cry out and say, God, when is all this gonna stop? Why is violence increasing? Why do people pick up guns and kill each other? Why do people go into stores and commit acts of mass shootings? Why do people in their own jobs a manager killed his own employee at a company. Why is all this going on? These are very serious times. And last night at the Christmas coffee house, I made a mention that because these times are perilous and things are increasing, that some people turn to fear and then some people are arming themselves. We see gun ownership in the United States and even around the world where it's permitted. Gun ownership is increasing because people are concerned about the violence and they want to protect themselves. What we see in this passage of Scripture in Isaiah, it's very clear that we won't have to worry about the violence. We won't have to worry about evil abounding. We won't have to worry about even sickness because Jesus himself is going to come back after these periods of time that I briefly mentioned, and he is going to rule on the planet Earth. And during this time of the millennial reign of Christ where he rules, there's going to be no more war. Isn't that something? No more war. Now, Jesus is king. And the Bible in Isaiah, several times it refers to him as the king of kings and that the Lord of lords. And it says, of Jesus' government, there will be no end. So I was looking up some of the kings that have been uh, exalted in our, in our history of humanity. And uh, I was thinking about who are some of the greatest kings that people espouse and people say, oh, these are, these are some fierce kings. These are fierce rulers. And I'm a student of history, and so I took an ancient history class. I took a world history class when I was in college, and I was fascinated by some of these leaders. And here's just a few of the leaders that come up on the list. Hitler, Adolf Hitler, was considered one of the greatest leaders. Odysseus, in Greek mythology, he was the great Greek king. Caesar. The Roman king Caesar was considered one of the great kings. Alexander the Great, he was also considered a great king. He conquered much of the known world. Joseph II, he was the Holy Roman Emperor from 1765 to 1790. Genghis Khan, they say Genghis Khan, he was the Asian leader. And they say he was perhaps one of the most notorious and brutal leaders of all time. But he also was one of the most successful. He founded the Mongol Empire, and he was one of the most powerful forces of the world at that time. He had brilliant military strategies. Queen Elizabeth I, another great queen leader of the world. She was queen of England and Ireland from 1558 until the day she died. She had many nicknames, the most famous of which being the Virgin Queen. Queen Elizabeth. Charlemagne, he was another great king. Charlemagne was uh, the king of the Franks from 768 to his death. He had a long record of accomplishment that proved his worth to be on the list. Napoleon, the French King Napoleon, he was known as the emperor. He was a prominent military and political leader of France. He heavily influenced European politics. And then uh, uh, the queen, uh, excuse me, the king of Ethiopia, Haile uh, Selassie. He was also known as one of the great kings of the earth. 
So you see these kings that are developing from every part of the planet, Europe, Africa, Asia, in the United States, Abraham, he wasn't a king. Abraham Lincoln was espoused as a great leader. So you see all these people that were world figures that people lay up in history as these renowned people, and then you compare them to Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. And the fact of the matter is, there is no comparison. Say amen. Now, one of the things that was interesting about these kings as I was studying them in histories in the past when I've studied them, and then recently as I've looked at them uh, currently, is that many of them were humans with faults and frailties. In the example of France, for example, there was a Louis XIV. He was another great king. What they did was they would have tremendous, tremendous wealth. They would have tremendous wealth. And the people around them were suffering. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> the people around them were suffering. And as a result, in the case of France, because they had such tremendous wealth and there was such a disparity between the common person and the king himself, the French Revolution followed. And so we see these kings of the earth in their rule, and some of them were powerful rulers, and some of them were great rulers, but they all had flaws. They all had problems. And the thing that's so beautiful about our passage today in Isaiah, this king we serve and this king who will rule one day is totally different than the kings of the earth. And essentially, we call him the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Look at what it says in Isaiah, the qualities about this queen, the king that makes him stand out from the rest. It says, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. His roots, a branch, will bear fruit. And so Jesus comes through the line of King David, and a, a, a promise was made to King David that his rule would have no end. And so Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise that was made to King David, and Jesus comes from the line of King David. And it's so amazing that here it is that we serve a God that made all creation, but we call Jesus the God-man because he's God and he's man at the same time, fully God, fully man. That's who Jesus is. And he comes through human means. Now, his coming was from the Holy Spirit, so he was the only perfect man. Mary, Mary was the vehicle of his birth. He was born a Virgin Mary, but he identifies with the humanity of all earth. Isn't that beautiful? He identifies with you. He identifies with me because he was a person just like you and I are persons, just like you and I have faults, and he sees us where we are. Even though he was faultless and perfect, he's the king that is the God king, the God man. And because he can identify with the human experience, he deserves to be exalted. And his exaltation is so powerful because the Bible declares that every knee and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. What does that mean, that Jesus Christ is God? So even people now who don't say that Jesus is God, even people now who don't believe in Jesus, one day they will have to confess and they're going to recognize Remember the scene on the cross when Jesus was crucified at the end of his torturous crucifixion? And there was this one centurion Roman soldier, and he stood by the cross, and he watched it all happen. He watched them make fun of Jesus. He watched them mock Jesus. He watched some of his fellow Roman soldiers even play craps for who was going to get Jesus' robe. And they gambled away Jesus' garment. He watched one of his Roman soldiers, one of his friends, one of his buddies, punch Jesus in the face before the crucifixion. Punched him in his face. He watched another Roman soldier take a whip and whip his back so blood was coming out of his black. Blood was coming out of his back. He watched the other Roman soldiers make fun of Jesus. He watched the Jewish leadership officials who say, save yourself. If you're the king of kings, if you're the king of the Jews, come down from the cross. He watched all of that. And somewhere along this crucifixion, now remember, this Roman soldier, if you studied history, they killed their enemies, and they would parade their killing of their enemies and people that broke the law 
with, with rows and rows of crosses of people that they had crucified. So the crucifixion was happening for a number of years, and they would line them up on the road into town as a symbol so that if you went against the Roman Empire, this is going to be your fate. So this Roman soldier had participated in many crucifixions, but there was something about this crucifixion. There was something about this person, Jesus, as he dies on the cross, as his hands were stretched wide, as his head was hanging low, as he heard Jesus say the seven last sayings on the cross, one of which was to his mother, his disciples. His mother was standing at the foot of the cross, and he confers the taking care of his mom to another fellow disciple. He says out of his mouth, Father, forgive them when they were cheering him. And he said, for they know not what they do. There were two thieves on either side of Jesus, and one thief mocked Jesus and said, Jesus, if you're the king, you can save yourself. Get us out of here. And he mocked Jesus. And the other thief next to Jesus on the cross, he said, we have done crimes that are worthy of death. He said to the other guy who was mocking Jesus, but this man has done nothing. And then he looked at Jesus and said, Lord, he said, have mercy on me, basically is what he says. And then Jesus says to him, today you will be with me in paradise. So the Roman soldier saw all of that. He sees a man who's being crucified. He knows that Jesus is innocent because at the trial, there was no evidence under Roman law, get this, that he should have been killed. This was a mock trial. This was an innocent man. This was not an act of justice. This was an act of injustice, one of the greatest acts. This Roman soldier knew of the law. He was a centurion. And he watches a man who's innocent. He watches a man who deserved to fight back, say nothing, and instead... He sees Jesus say with one of his final breaths, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So Jesus forgives all these people that wronged him, all the people that mocked him, all the people that put him on trial. He forgave the Roman soldier. And by the way, there were several Roman soldiers during the ministry of Jesus' three years on the earth who Jesus ministered to. He ministered to Roman soldiers. Even though he knew some of these Roman soldiers were going to kill him, he ministered to them. There was one soldier, Roman soldier on occasion who had a servant who was sick, and he came to Jesus and said, Jesus, have mercy on my servant. And Jesus had mercy on his servant and essentially healed the Roman soldier's servant. So getting back to the centurion who was at the cross, he sees Jesus. And after it's all done, Jesus breathes his last breath. And the Roman soldier says, surely he was the son of God. You know, I believe that Roman soldier is in heaven today. That was his confession of who Jesus was. He recognized that the whole system of Rome was wrong. It was wrong. So he is a king who doesn't sit in a high palace and sits away from the people and eats steak and lobster. And the people are just eating moldy bread. But here's a king who comes among us and has a meal, has the bread and the cup, and eats with the people, the commoners on the street. He went over to Zacchaeus' house and had meals. Zacchaeus was a notorious sinner. He's a king that lives among you. He's not a king that's removed. And so when his millennial reign comes, these are the virtues and the qualities of who he is. It says he's going to come from a human person. He's going to be, he's in verse 2, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. How often have you gone to a court or seen a court case or seen a legal, uh, a legal trial and you say, that's not justice? How often have you seen some judges make decisions and you go, that's not the right? Judge Judy sometimes gets it wrong. <laughs> All these other judge shows, sometimes they get it wrong. And you go, that's not justice, but this king is going to have the spirit of wisdom and of understanding. Wisdom means knowing right from wrong. Wisdom is appropriating the truth of the matter. This is who Jesus is, the spirit of counsel and of might. It says in Isaiah that he's the everlasting father. He's the almighty God. He's the prince of peace. He's going to have power. He's going to have might. He's going to have wisdom. And it says, and he's going to have knowledge 
and the fear of the Lord. And it says twice in verse 3, it says, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. The scripture in Proverbs says the beginning of wisdom is to have fear. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Jesus is going to have wisdom because he's ruling in keeping with his heavenly Father. Jesus is ruling with the power of the Holy Spirit in his life because our God is a God who's one but who manifests himself. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so God the Son, which is Jesus Christ, is going to have the Spirit of God working in his heart at all times. And so when he rules on earth, and there will be people during the millennial reign of Jesus who will try to oppose him, but he is going to have knowledge and fear. And as I'm going down these virtues of Jesus, Compare it to all these great kings that I just mentioned to you earlier. Compare it to the kings that have had shortcomings, the kings who have made bad decisions, the kings who have engaged their people in wars they shouldn't have been warring on, and compare this to this king of kings. And then in verse 3, it says, He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. This is a king who's going to have supernatural wisdom and ability and discretion, and if someone just says something, you don't have to take it at face value because the king of kings is going to know the true heart and the true intentions of a man or a woman. And so this king doesn't judge by what he sees. He doesn't judge by what he hears, but this king has supernatural wisdom, knowledge, and ability. And then look what it says in verse 4. But with righteousness... He will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. Isn't that comforting to know that Jesus is going to look at every person who's being taken advantage of, either in our court system, our legal system, in our economic system, in our social life, people are put down. Jesus cares about those people who have been abused and put aside and abandoned. And that's why you and I can have the comfort of knowing that when someone in this life does us wrong, we don't always have to pick up the sword. We don't always have to pick up the gun. We don't always have to even engage the legal system and sue. Although sometimes God may lead us to do that. But we know that we have a savior, a king, who's going to make right. Listen to this. Every wrong that's ever been done to you and me, Jesus is going to make it right. Let me repeat that. Every wrong that's ever been done to you and me, Jesus is going to make it right. So we don't have to fight. We can rely on what Jesus said when he said, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay because he, see what that, he saw what that person did to you, and he has a record of it. And there's going to come a day, and this is a very sobering statement I'm getting ready to make. There's going to come a day in time when every man, every woman is going to have to stand before the court of heaven and every person that's been abused, every person that's been mistreated, and that they have not asked forgiveness of their sins, and if they have continued to do the wrong deeds that they have done, they're going to stand before the court of heaven. And Jesus himself is going to judge them, and he's going to say guilty. <laughs> for all the sins that they committed against other people, their family, their friends, Jesus is going to hold them accountable, and he's going to say, depart from me. But we who are blood washed, we just took communion today. We who have been forgiven of our sins, because all of us are sinners, the truth is we all are in the human condition alike. We all have this common experience. If we have said yes to Jesus, Jesus no longer sees us through our imperfections and our sins and our wrongs, but he sees us, and God sees us through the shed blood of Jesus, and we are forgiven of everything we have done wrong, every sin that we've committed. And he says, well done, come into my kingdom, into the joys of eternal life. And here's the good news. We are on earth now. We're still living. We still have problems. But because we walk in a state of forgiveness now, we can every day of our lives say, you know, Jesus has forgiven me. And so now I can forgive my brother and sister that offends me because Jesus is going to be the final reconciler of all the bad things that are going on. 
So it says that he's going to care about those who have had bad decisions done against them. And then it says in verse 4, and then it says in the end of verse 4, it says, He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips. He will slay the wicked. During that time, Jesus is going to have authority over every situation. He's going to be the supreme leader of the entire world. And those who don't want to repent, those who don't want to accept his rule, Jesus is going to immediately judge them, and they're going to be done away with. In verse 5, righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. And then it gives us this picture that there's going to be so much knowledge and peace and love overall during the lamb, during the time of Jesus' rule, that even the wild animals are going to live in peace with the lesser animals that don't have power, the lion and the lamb. The baby can even put his hand in the cobra's uh, den and the baby will not be killed because there's going to be a knowledge of the peace of God. So we have something to look forward to, the coming of the Lord. It's going to be great. There's going to be a time of peace. So here's what we need to do. We don't want anybody to perish. We don't want anybody to come under God's and Jesus' wrath. So we're in the time of grace. Everybody say grace. So here's the good news. I've given you a picture of what's going to happen in the millennial reign of Christ, during the great tribulation, during the rapture. And we'll go into these things a lot more in the book of Revelation and the study. And Elder Chuck is going to be leading us in the new year. And I want you to come to that class so that you'll know about the end times, so that you won't have to be fearful. And in the meantime, Jesus tells us to occupy. Everybody say occupy. And the word occupy means to stay busy about loving people, serving people, telling them about Jesus. During this Christmas season, look at every opportunity when you're in the store, when you have a family get together. Uh, I had a time where I was able to go to the singing Christmas tree, and my son Timothy and his wife Alicia and Amila and Taryn went, and the gospel was presented, and we were singing the hallelujah chorus, and I was raising my hand and praising God. And then this morning, I saw um, um, Amila and Taryn again. They they were here taking communion a few minutes ago before they left to go in the back. And I looked, them, looked at them and I said, I love you so much. Thank you for coming to church with Grandpa. Every opportunity we have that we can get as believers in Jesus Christ, we need to tell somebody we love them. We need to serve somebody. We were talking about that in class tomorrow, this morning. We need to serve somebody. We need to lay up treasures in heaven. And that means for us to love and be about the master's business. And oh, by the way, I got to brag about this church. Last night, we had a great time. Give yourselves a hand clap in the Lord. Christmas Coffee House. We were serving people. Those people that were serving at the tables, because we served them all kind of wonderful desserts. And they came to the tables, and I was kind of a floater. They, they didn't give me any main tasks. So the pastor was able to float. So I sat at one table for a little while. I sat near Deborah for a little while. I went to another table, and then I was just watching. And the servers were coming, you that were serving, were coming to the tables, and you, you just came with your coffee, and you came with your desserts. May I help you, please? Do you want more of this? Do you want some water? Do you need anything else? Where's the bed? And you showed them everything. You was there for them. You helped them. And people were just happy having a good time. People were having such a good time, saints of God. Some of you that are holy and austere might not like this. But people were having such a good time that we had some good old music. People got up and started dancing. <laughs> people started and got dancing, and they were having a good old time. And we had a band called the Ian James Band, and he was singing all the good Christmas songs, and then he did a little R&B, and we were dancing and having a good time. And by the way, you don't know this. Maybe you do, maybe you don't know, but Eon is a Christian. And because I was talking to the boy and he was telling me his love for the Lord and he was playing that music, but he was loving the Lord as he was doing it. And so we all had a good time. And because you serve people, we had a great time. This place was packed with people at the end of the evening when we gave the gospel call and the gospel message. And I asked people to bow their heads. I was telling people at class this morning, this is what I observed. Every head in the place was bowed. You know, there's sometimes, like sometimes when we have our outdoor events on the, on the lawn, when we do our, our family day outside, and we have the band playing, and we have all kind of music, and sometimes when we give a call to receive Christ and we do the gospel message, there'll be some people who will be really uh, kind of 
defined, you know, they don't believe in God and they don't know about this Christian stuff. So they ain't bowing their heads and they, you can see they're a little defined. That's okay. You got to give people their space. Let them be who they are. But last night, because you served them with love, there were smiles in the place. Remember the old uh, uh, movie, TV series called Fantasy Island? He would always start out by saying, smile, smiles, everybody. This is Fantasy Island. So he'd make people smile. So that's what we had going on here. People were smiling. When they came through the door, you were happy. I didn't see anybody frowning. I didn't see anybody got mad. And then I got to brag on my sister Karen because I was... Because I was floating. Karen, I didn't get a chance to get no dessert. And so I was seeing all the good desserts that were being eaten. And I'm sitting over here at the table, and I was getting ready to go MC. And someone said, this is from Karen. And she brought me a plate of desserts. Thank you, Karen. I just blessed my heart. She remembered me to get some desserts. And the reason that they were open to the gospel, and when I said the prayer and asked everybody to bow their heads, was it because they were loved on? They were cared for, and then they respected the attitude that was in the house, and you guys did it. And I am so grateful that this church took this opportunity, and many of you brought your friends and your neighbors, and they heard the gospel. The message was presented, and we may not see the immediate response, but we will see a response someday. And here's the good news. We want everyone, including everyone here, and we want many more. We have many empty seats in this church. And so over time, as we continue to do these events, as you continue to tell your neighbors about the Lord and bring them to church, we are going to have a full church because there's so many people that need the Lord. And this church is going to be on the forefront of leading and serving people to the Lord. Let the church say amen. All right, can you stand to your feet? This is a very sobering, serious moment. Some of you weren't able to make it last night. Some of you did make it. But you can see the seriousness of the moment that we saw last night and the seriousness of the moment right now. The Holy Spirit is touching hearts. And the Bible says that God is not willing, God does not desire that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So as we just stand here for a few minutes together and as we remember what Jesus did on the cross for us, that he forgave us. And when I I got to the point as a young man that I said yes to him, and then I fully realized the depth of what Jesus did for David, I was a hater. I had an anger problem. I accepted his love. I asked him to forgive me, and he changed my heart. And some of you this morning have issues in your life. You know what they are. You don't have to yell it out loud to all of us here now, but you know what the issues of your heart are. Some of us need and have room for improvement. We need to get better. We need to get closer to God. We need to let go of that thing, that sin that doth easily beset thee, the King James Version. That means the thing that you're weak for. And I'm going to ask you to surrender that this morning. And I'm going to ask that the bondages would be broken in the name of Jesus. And as I get ready to pray, I want you to say, yes, Lord, I agree with Pastor David. I let go of that thing right now in Jesus' name, and I want to exchange it. Every head that's bowed, every eye closed, it's a holy moment. If you have a need of something being lifted from your life, if you have a need of salvation, whatever it is, just raise your hand. I want to pray for you. Is it one? Is it two? Pastor, I need something. Yes, I see that hand. Is it another? Pastor, I need God to move in my heart in a deeper and a greater way. Yes, I see that hand. And as we now pray together as the family of God, we want hands to be raised before God as this community of faith that others who need the Lord can receive them in the fullness of his love. Father God, those that have raised their hand and those that are standing here this morning, all of us have a desire to get closer to you. So we ask, oh God, that you would help people right now in the name of Jesus to exchange that which holds them down for the love and the power and the strength of God through your precious Holy Spirit. May there be an exchange this morning. 
May people say yes to you in those areas of their heart. May people say yes to you if they need salvation. And let your Holy Spirit move in each of our lives today. That as we say yes to you during this season, during this Christmas season in particular, we are going to be light for those who are in dark places. We pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now everybody hold your hands up to heaven and just say, Lord Jesus, I receive your love. I receive your grace. I receive your peace. Give the Lord a hand clap for what he's done. He's done something great. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You may be seated. We're going to have the announcements by Sister Latasha. Thank you. Good morning, church. We want to welcome visitors and guests. We have our welcome card we'd love to have you fill out so we can know more about you. And if you're a member, we'd love to pray for you. So if you have prayer requests, please put them down. We're a praying church, so we'd love to pray for you. Um, we had our Christmas coffee house last night. It was awesome. Well, so we can scratch that off the list for announcements. That's done. Um, but what we have next is December 18th, the real Christmas story. The choir is going to sing. If you were here last night, you heard a couple songs, but we got a couple more up our sleeve that you'll hear on the 18th. Uh, if you invited somebody to the coffee house, invite them back on the 18th. Um, it could be a good ministry opportunity. Then we'll have our Christmas Eve candlelight service at 6 p.m. Um, on Christmas Eve. <laughs> And then on Christmas Day, uh, we will be here at 10 a.m. for a one-hour service. The Christmas Eve and the Christmas Day service will be one-hour services. Um, we still are handing out ornaments. If you have an ornament, we would like to have those gifts back by December 11th. If you would like an ornament, please just come see me afterwards. And Janet is uh, wanting to bless all the kids with a gift bag. So you can just grab one of these sheets of paper from me, and they're also in the foyer as well. And you're just going to pick one item off the list to bring back so she can get each of the kids back there a, a, a gift. And um, we have Sister Up is going to be December 10th which is next Saturday, right? <laughs> uh, so, okay, <laughs> just checking. And it's going to be at Sister Heather Baldwin's house. So if you don't have Sister Heather Baldwin's address, please come see me. It's going to be fun. It's going to be our last gathering um, for the year. And so we're going to have some food. There's going to be some crafts. So ladies, come see me. I'd love to have you be there. The men will also be meeting. No crafts, guys, sorry. But the men will be meeting December 10th um, as well at 8 a.m. here at the church. So please, if you haven't had a chance this year to check it out, Give us, a, give us a shot to dive into God's word and get fellowship with your brothers and sisters. And please continue giving online um, <clears throat> through PushPay or the offering in the back. And I will ask you all to stand so Chuck can give us the benediction. Thank you. We may not have crafts, Latasha, but we have donuts. Yay! What a great service this morning, remembering that Jesus, what he did for us, and we took communion in remembrance of him. And we should never forget that. And Pastor also brought out that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So in light of that, that we don't forget that, hear these words. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever amen so have a good day go out enjoy the snow Ooh, look at it coming down tell someone about the love of Jesus amen